Hello, my name is Charles Sparakis, and I brought Hanno in here to talk a little bit more about some of his latest work with the robots. He's emphasizing robots and kids this, uh, this time around, and he currently lives in New Zealand and is sponsoring a variety of programs to get kids more interested in electronics and robotics. So without further ado, here's Hanno. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Google, for having me back here. I was here exactly a year ago. I'm um, talking about my dance bot, which is a balancing robot that dances with kids using computer vision. And this year I'll talk about 12 blocks, which is a simple block language that lets kids program sophisticated multi-core robots um, very easily. So first I'll talk about a little bit New Zealand. Um, so I moved there five years ago now, and there's a bit more than sheep down there. Um, I contacted a couple of local um, companies in Christchurch, New Zealand, which is where I live. And so this is what my neighbors and friends are up to. Um, Glenn Martin is building the first practical jetpack. Um, $100,000 buys you a backpack you strap on and lets you fly um, through the air um, thousands of feet up for about 30 minutes. And it was shown at the last Oshkosh very successfully. Um, the Yike bike could fit in really well here at Google um, with the Segways. It's a very light folding bike, fits in the back, strap it on, and there you go. A friend of mine is doing a GPS boomerang, so it flies up to edge of space with a helium balloon and returns with a GPS sensor right to um, about three hours later, hits you on the top of your head. and. Um, gives you your sensor readings and lots of telemetry information about what's going on in the atmosphere. Uh, another friend of mine is um, doing the first color x-ray. So they developed a novel sensor for CERN and that's currently being used at the Mayo Clinic to grab color images from x-rays. So they're still using the same x-ray emitter but they're using a special detector to count actual photons looking at their energy level and with that getting the composition of what the x-ray um, went through. Uh, another um, guy is doing WhisperGen and that's a four-cylinder Serling engine which provides residential heat and power and it's currently in trials in Europe. And um, another um, guy is doing a pivotal engine so instead of a piston going up and down in an engine um, this has a pivot where the explosion happens in the same chamber, but it's stationary on one side, so it's pivoting. And so with this, you get very high power density, it's quiet, and it can run on hydrogen, since you're able to water cool the whole engine and the piston. Um, and there's another company called Jade in Christchurch that does a very high-speed database. Um, so I have to keep up with these other guys, and so I've been busy too. Um, I'm more busy on the hobby and electronics and getting kids into um, robotics side. And so I'll take a minute to talk about what I've done there. Um, so I wrote a book um, with some other uh, co-authors. Um, we're all using the Parallax Propeller. It's a high-speed, um, multi-core, um, semiconductor chip that lets you do a lot of the things that I'll talk about here today. So it has um, memory, it has eight processors running at 80 megahertz, and it has a lot of input and output pins to let you interface with um, sensors and actuators and motors. So this is a 500 page book and I wrote about my balancing robot that I talked about here last year. I also developed a prop scope. So this is a um, $250 um, little blue box that reads analog signals on one side and connects to your computer with USB. And it also um, can be used as a function generator, a spectrum analyzer, a logic state analyzer. So um, basically everything that you did in college with a big lab full of instruments is now in a little box that you can take home um, look at signals. Okay, and I'm also developed a tool called Viewport that lets you 
um, develop very sophisticated projects that build on this parallax chip. And I'll show that a little bit in my demos. And that includes um, very graphical debugging tools. So it includes the standard breakpoint and call stack and memory map and stepping in and out of um, um, in, in syntax, but it also has simulated instruments like an oscilloscope, a logic analyzer, that let you look at what's going on in your system. So if you've ever wondered why your program isn't running the way it is, but it, it should, um, with this you can go back in time. So you can see, well, 10 minutes ago, this is what happened. Um, this is what the sensors were reading. This is what your mathematical model was doing. And that helps you develop um, more complex, more sophisticated embedded systems. Integrated in here is OpenCV, so a complete computer vision library is in there, as well as fuzzy logic tools. So that's all in there. And finally, 12 blocks. Um, so 12 blocks is my answer to my daughter when she asked me, what are you doing? You're, you're always programming, you're always on your computer. Can I try? Can I do something? Um, she's five years old. And I didn't think it would be a good idea t giving her a, a C book and um, showing her and teaching her a complete language. Um, at the time, she was playing with Legos and putting them together, stacking them. There are other software out there. Um, MIT Scratch developed a wonderful graphical tool. Um, Lego Mindstorm also has a block-based interface. But uh, there's a lot of problems with those, and so I tried to come up with a solution to those in 12 blocks. And 12 blocks is also a language that is completely focused on embedded systems. So it's a visual language, but it's developed for robots, um, for um, embedded systems that have actuators, that have sensors, and um, go from there. So I call it 12 blocks because when everything is contained in a block, so very object-oriented, then it's very easy to build very sophisticated things in a small number of blocks. You're no longer looking at pages and pages of code. Um, all the demos that I'll show you today are in a handful of blocks. And there are many blocks available, so there is a library, you can create your own blocks, and um, there's about a hundred plus blocks. I'll show you a sampling of those a little bit later. And I like to say that it has a very gentle learning curve, but it reaches very high. So you can start out using this um, when you're still in elementary school and when you're still just dragging a couple blocks together. But you can keep using it to university beyond because it's very functional, it's very sophisticated. Um, and um, there's a lot of power there. It has live edit capability, so you can keep editing your program while it's running. I'll show that. Graphical, to, graphical debugging, which um, lets you look at graphs instead of looking at variables and looking at lines of code. And it's integrated with a wiki, so with an internet, you can um, look at videos, you can look at schematics, share everything with a wiki, and it's all integrated there. And you can create standalone programs, so similar to how I build the prop scope by developing some firmware and building a PC user interface, this lets you, with 12 blocks, develop both the firmware running on the embedded system, but also the user interface that other users that don't have access to 12 blocks can use to run the program. <coughs> And I mentioned you can customize your own blocks, and it's very easy to transition to other languages. Uh, Parallax, the company behind the propeller, developed a object-oriented language called Spin, and um, that's a very nice, very powerful language for writing textual code for the propeller. But there is also ANSI C available, so if you're used to C, you can program these types of robots in C as well and you can transition from 12 blocks all the way to writing C code and going from there. So I won't read all these off, but there is plenty of capability. Um, there is a standard computer science where you have arrays and you have state machines and events and messages, strings. 
um, user interface, graphic capabilities, so plugging it into a TV and then building a graphical game, what sprites and vector graphics, sound, so type in your own score um, or sound effects, play MIDI files, as well as reading and using actuators and sensors. So looking at a proximity sensor, looking at a wheel encoder, all that sort of stuff that you typically do with robots, with embedded systems, is, is always just a block where you drag the block somewhere, connect it, and away you go. So the robot that I'll demo today um, was built by Chad, and um, it's a very sophisticated platform that fits in a kid's hand. So it's light, small, um, robust, made out of metal. You can screw Meccano and Vex um, components to this, as well as plug in Lego pieces. So again, going from very simple, basic Lego type expandability to really doing um, hardware expansion. Um, and this is really designed to get you started with robots at the simple level, so driving it like a remote control car, um, where you're not programming at all, but also lets you do things like logo. I started with logo in um, elementary school, where you have a turtle and you tell it to move forwards and then turn right and you repeat for a while. And then you move up to using sensors. So uh, some of these sensors that I talked about and integrating that to control what the robot's doing. And all of this is done with 12 blocks where you visually program it. And I'll show how you can transition to the text-based languages as well. So what I'll do in my demos is I'll use 12 blocks, which has this library, which has a worksheet where I assemble programs and then has views, and within the view, I can look at what's going on in the robot. Um, and on the T-Bot side, there is shared memory that's shared between the PC and between the robot. So both have access to it. Um, it's actually in the T-Bot, but I can read and write it from the PC. And later I'll show how that same concept of shared memory can be extended to when you have multiple robots. So again, there is memory on each T-Bot, but the T-Bots and 12 blocks can read and write that memory remotely. And on the T-Bot side, that memory controls how the motor moves, how the speaker sounds, what the microphone is doing. Um, so it's all a very simple architecture that is very functional. I keep saying that, I, I keep focusing on this um, benefit of being able to easily transition from grade school to very advanced things. But now there's a lot of robots out there that are targeted at one specific item and one specific challenge, one specific competition. Um, and I think that this lets people um, use the same platform with expanding it either through software, through hardware, um, through electronically changing things. And on the software side, starting with um, 12 blocks, but then growing into SPIN and ANSI C code at the end. Little tease for um, the advanced people. Um, so what I'll show at the end is using wireless to compete, to connect multiple robots, and using sensor information from one robot to control another robot while monitoring the whole system on the PC. And this can be extended to programming re remotely wirelessly, as well as connecting to internet, so causing the robot to move or to play a sound if something on the internet, a, a stock, a weather changes, as well as sending data measurements from the robot, um, if it's video, if it's a sensor reading, sending that back up to the internet. And of course, internet, mobile devices, so um, Bond movies always have a scene where you take a robot and um, or you, you drive a car with an iPhone or um, Android. So um, that's, that's all possible here, too. So demo-wise, um, these are some things that people could do right out of the box with us, where they uh, start with remote controlling a car. Um, this is what uh, my daughter would be starting out with, or even my son. 
Um, then moving on to drawing logo shapes, moving up to integrating sensors and using those to control the robot. Then line follow is a very common challenge where there's a black line on the white paper and you try to stay on the line go as quickly as possible. Communicating with the shared memory, um, mail terminal, so a very functional uh, communication networking protocol for sending data back and forth, and then uh, tr um, trying C code and spin code. So moving on to demos, um, I'll clear a little bit of an area here. So here's, here's a robot, and I will switch over to 12 blocks. So 12 blocks is a um, Windows application, and it has this interface. I can start a new program, and as I mentioned, it has this library section where you have multiple types of blocks to let you do graphic manipulation, to let you do um, sensor measurements, um, and even to build user interfaces. And here in the middle is a worksheet. And for this first program, I'll do what the simplest thing that we can do with a robot, just to have it move a little bit. And so we start with a start block. So I'm just dragging it from the library onto the worksheet. And I take a block from the TBOT section, the move block, and it shows me that these are able to connect. Of course, I can't connect it to the top and I can't connect it to the library, so this is the one place where I can connect it. And now I can hit the run button and this will load the program into the robot and cause it to move backwards um, for one second. So it's a very simple program, but it's something where I've just taken two blocks, connected them, and right away it did something. So next demo that I'll show is doing some basic input-output. So there is a proximity sensor on here, there is line sensors, um, and there's wheel encoders. What we'll do in this demo is look at the proximity sensor to see if there's something in front of it. And there's a full color LED on there, and right now it's showing a blue light, so I will, I'll be able to control um, the, light, the color of that light. So I'll take away the move block, I'll just throw it back into the library, and I have a start, and what I'll do is um, I'll set the LED to a color, and I will get the proximity sensor value. And this is a specially shaped block which fits into another block. So here is a variable assignment block. So set x to 1. That's how it starts out. But I can drag this and dock it in there. <coughs> so now I have three, four blocks, a start block, a block that sets the color of LED. Um, and a block which sets x, the variable x, to the value of a sensor. Um, just to keep this going, I'm going to use a repeat block. So this is a loop, and I'll dock these inside of the repeat block. So this is pretty straightforward. And I'll hit the run button. And um, the LED starts out red, hope you can see it's red there, and I mentioned that I can edit things as it's running, so I can click here on the red and pull down from these choices and select a different color, and so now I have a blue light shining on the robot. Um, and so I can do that with all of these items that are in yellow, these are parameters, and these are changeable while the program's running. The value of x is supposedly being set to the value of the proximity sensor. Um, typically with embedded systems you have this problem where it's in the processor, but there's no way of looking into it. 
So typically what you do is you hook up all sorts of other gadgets to it. The nice thing here is that we're connected to the PC, and on the PC, I have a interface for looking at these values. So here is X, and here is a value of X. And it's right now at a certain level. And if I, um, if I put my hand in front of it, I, I can change that value. And um, I can plot this over time. So right now I'm plotting just the X value, and I can plot this over seconds there. And um, so I can, I can look at the value as it changes over time. Um, what I'll do in this case is move on to um, showing how to build a user interface based on this. Um, so instead of having to go in here and clicking these values and changing from blue to purple, or some other color. I'm going to build a simple um, user interface for that. So I'll go into the user interface section, and there's a background. And I can use a text box and just drag that on top of there. And this text box will set the variable n to whatever is typed into it. So instead of setting the LED to the color purple, I'll set the LED to the number n. And now when I run the program again, um, I, have, um, I can type into this number, into this text box, a different number. So zero is red. And now when I type 120 into here, it changes the LED to um, a different color. I can save these um, 12 block files. Um, so I'll just give it a file name. And I can also save it as an, a standalone executable. So I can save as, and in here I can call it uh, Google, and in this case, a Google EXE file. And um, now I can hit save, and that file is now saved to this directory. So I will go there. blocks, tutorials, and here's a new file um, just created right now, 254. Um, I will close 12 blocks, so I'm, I've now given this to a colleague of mine, and they want to change the LED on my, on my robot, and so they can just run this megabyte file. And what this first does is it loads the firmware to the um, robot, and then it gives me this little user interface that I've designed in 12 blocks. So um, it just shows me n equals this. I could type a value in here, so 120 is what I had last time, and then it changes the color of that LED. So it's building the firmware inside of 12 blocks, as well as a user interface to um, work with the sensors, work with actuators, and um, bundling all of that into an executable that you can then run somewhere else. Okay. Um, so that's with 12 blocks, and with 12 blocks um, we can do more. Um, I'll now move into transitioning from the 12 block visual language to spin. So when you're more advanced or when you want to go into building your own blocks or when you want to um, use a more powerful debugger, then you can do that with a text language. So I'll take the same code that I had before. Um, so I'll bring up 12 blocks again. And um, I'll take our um, Google one that we just had. And what I'll do now is, just like you do on the internet, you have a, in an internet browser, you have a view code button. And so you have that here. And what view code does is bring up a tool that's called viewport that has a, 
syntax highlighting editor in there, as well as lots of graphical tools to let you debug that program. And inside of here, I have the spin equivalent code of my program. So um, you can see down here that it's doing a repeat loop and it's setting the um, HSL to N. And in here, I can make changes. I can, um, I can do that. But first thing what I'll do is I'll just load this program. So from a different environment, I'm now loading this to the robot. And I have a tool like the DSO viewer. So in here, I can look at the values, or I can change a value. So I get a text box again for setting the color of my LED. So it started with 0, and 120 is a nice color blue. So I can do something like that, um, as well as graphing that over time. Um, so there's that, and then over time it goes down. And what's also in here is I can set breakpoints. So here's line 89. And I can now compile this with debugging information and load this to the propeller, to the robot. And this will now stop on that breakpoint and give me all sorts of debugging tools for this. So I can look at the files. I can look at the code. But I also have a memory map of all the information that's in the propeller, as well as a watch list of variables, a call stack, a profiler, seeing where the time is being spent, a view of the pins, the sort of actual hardware um, interface of what's going on with the propeller. And I have a command interpreter, so I can, for example, take 10 steps, and it'll take 10 steps in there. I can take um, one step at a time, so sort of going between those two. Um, so the traditional Visual Studio type of debugging is integrated in here. Um, okay. And the uh, last thing that I'll show here is that I can make changes in here. So I can change the intensity of the LED. So I'll make it um, very dim. I'll set it to 5. And I can save this file. And now when I go back to 12 blocks, um, it says, do you want to reload it? So it noticed that the file that I was viewing had changed. And now I can say yes to this. Um, and then the, the values are changed, and I can go from there. Um, next demo. So I can transition to C. So in the same viewport tool that I showed earlier, I can look at a C project. And this is a standard um, code, code blocks um, project file. So I can change the compiler options, the link options, environment options. And I can look at standard ANSI C that I can compile for the same robot. And um, this, this is very simple. It blinks the um, back LED on here. So there's a little LED. Right now it's blinking very, very fast. But also for the ANSI C part, there is a compiler a debugger, and so I can um, compile it with debugging information. And now in the C compiler, C, C debugger, I can set a breakpoint and run up to that point and um, keep stepping around here. And now you can see the LED is um, blinking every time I go past that instruction. Um, so, so far we've seen at the very high level using a visual programming language and using and interfacing with the sensors, a higher level, which is the spin language, and then going all the way down to C code and stepping one line at a time to blink an LED. Okay. Okay. Now, shared memory um, requires two robots, so have two robots running here. And what I can do here is I can um, open a single program. 
So this is a slightly longer program, but it still easily fits on the page. And what this program does is it runs on two robots and uses a shared memory structure that I can monitor with 12 blocks to set the LED color on one robot to the proximity sensor reading of the other robot. So I'm going to change the proximity value on one to change the color on the other. And I need to load this into both robots. So I'll start by loading into one of them. Let's see which one. First I have to Okay. Both robots are on. Okay. So this robot on the right now, I can look at what the sensor reading is doing here. And what's th what this one's doing is in I3, it's putting the value of the proximity sensor. So you can see that it's going from 30-ish um, when I'm close to it to 180 or so when I'm further away. Here, I'll graph it so we can look at it. Um, okay. So you can see on the graph that as I'm moving my hand back and forth that the sensor value is changing. And this, is, this sensor reading is put into the shared memory of I3. So I3 is where this one is putting its reading. I can now connect to the other robot that was, and load this robot with the same program. But that robot is looking at I3 to set its LED and storing its sensor reading into I0. Okay. So we'll look at both I0 and I3. And now if you look at the other robot, as I'm moving the, as I'm, and I'll disconnect the, so I'll make this one truly wireless. And so what's going on is it's taking readings with the proximity sensor. And I can look at those readings on my graph over here. So you'll see the red line goes up and down as I'm moving my hand back and forth over here. And the other robot is receiving that information and using that to change its state. So we're taking readings on one and affecting the behavior of the other. And it goes both ways. So I can change the reading over here to change the LED over here. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's what I was here to show. Um, 12 blocks going all the way from starting a program, adding a move block, moving the robot, all the way to using shared memory to uh, control a robot remotely with wireless and looking at the result on the PC. Any questions? So I noticed your, your blocks was, looked a lot like a flow chart rather than a data flow program. Did you think about a data flow model at all? Um, so there are many different visual ways of creating a program. This one is still somewhat linear. So it starts at a top and goes down. It is in two dimensions. So. Um, if, so some of these programs that I have, um, or I can sort of show you. So of course you have two dimensions and so you can put it together. Um, this is what I thought would be the easiest for a beginner to get started with, reading from top to bottom and naturally reading what's going on. So, yeah. Um, so I have a couple questions. Uh, one is, I know this is very different from uh, the Arduino microcontroller, but could you say uh, any comments on how how this compares and would your uh, programming language, could that be ported to the Arduino? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So yes, at the moment, um, everything I showed here used the parallax propeller multi-core processor. Um, the nice thing with that architecture is that it has eight processors in that chip, and so I'm using one of those processors to establish the shared memory connection. Um, the connection is just a serial interface. Um, and there is a documented protocol of how that information is shared between the two. I currently, so on this device list over here, um, I currently support several robots as well as a simulator, as well as Java for the LEGO Mindstorm NXT. Um, so already I'm taking this visual programming language and outputting different codes depending on what device you want to interface with. So if you want to interface with one of these robots, then it would output the spin code that runs natively on the device. If you want to run in a Python simulator, then the same program um, that you have here on screen can be saved and run inside of a Python environment or it can be saved as Java code. So you're just mapping blocks to the native language that you want to support. So in terms of Arduino support, I don't have it right now, but the interface, um, the communication link is serial, so that's straightforward. And um, instead of outputting whatever commands I used here to move a robot back and forth, I would have to, or someone else would have to write the library to do that and map that back to these blocks. Okay. And I, I noticed that you have uh, primitives like set LED, which is different from your set, you know, variable. Um, is that set LED, how is that tied to the hardware? And so there is a block manager um, under tools, and what this lets you do is map the blocks and what they look like and how many children they have. So if you're looking at nested items like an if or a repeat, um, and it lets you map those to your language that you want to support. So if you want to um, go to spin code, what you have is you have object files that you include and you need to set up some global variables or variables to pass information and you need to set something up at the beginning of a program and use something in between. So when I'm blinking an LED, um, this is driven by I squared C, so there's an I squared C chip in there and so when you set the LED to a certain value, um, the driver that's actually doing that at the end of the day is written in assembly and doing some bit banging to set the I squared C device to a certain state. Whereas the variable assignment in this particular language is straightforward like it is in most, where set X to one um, does not require any other variables, does not require any um, other objects, it's just setting a variable to one. So some of these blocks are very complex and some of them are very simple. Oh, and how was the, the robots, were they communicating over Bluetooth? Um, so we have different ways that they communicate. Um, today they're communicating over XB. Um, it's a $19 solution, different ways, and you can have multiple robots up to thousands. Um, and this particular one has a range of about a kilometer um, and works very nicely. 100, 100 some kilobyte, um, kilobyte per second. And um, what we did is we developed a very flexible communication tool that lets you share memory, but also send messages back and forth, like mail, where you're forced to respond and where you're able to command the other robot to do something, as well as terminal em emulation. Um, so all of that's running on the same um, hardware. Very nice. So I might have missed this, but um, is any of this for sale, or is this just a project right now? 
Um, getting very close, so mm -hmm. about a month or so away from selling the T-Bots. Um, they were initially designed for summer camps where students um, go to a summer camp and are mentored and um, at the end of a camp there's a competition. Um, so that's what these are built for. Um, 12 blocks has been for sale. I've been selling that for six months now. Oh, okay. Um, and the prop scope parallax sells that, and viewport I sell that as well. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to hanoware.com, um, then you'll get a link to all of those. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much.